Shalom, my friends. Welcome to this important conversation with me. Most likely you have had at least one encounter with someone who has tried to influence you to embrace the Christian faith. It may have been a Christian friend, a neighbor, or business associate, or maybe someone approached you from a missionary group like Jews for Jesus. You may have received an unsolicited email advancing missionary arguments or heard an invitation to get saved from a television evangelist while channel surfing. Jews for Judaism, the world's leading counter-missionary organization, has prepared this video to help you understand the tactics and respond to the claims of missionaries who challenge your Jewish faith. Who is behind Jews for Jesus? Most Christian denominations, including Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches, and most mainline Protestant groups, such as the United Church, no longer have programs to convert Jews. On the other hand, evangelical Protestants, who constitute over 25% of the American population, devote a tremendous amount of money and energy to promote their faith among Jews. These evangelicals fund over 1,000 different ministries worldwide, that especially target the Jewish community for conversion. Jews for Jesus is one of the largest and best known of these groups. Why do evangelical Christians seek to convert Jews? Evangelicals assert that the only way to have a relationship with God is by embracing Jesus. They feel driven to save all non-Christians who they believe will be doomed to an eternity in hell unless they convert. But isn't it true that evangelical Christians are very supportive of Israel? Yes, many evangelicals are lending important political and financial support to the state of Israel. However, most of them also engage in or support efforts to convert Jews to Christianity. Are these missionary groups really a serious threat? Unfortunately, these groups have become increasingly successful. Over the past 40 years, more than 350,000 Jews worldwide have been converted, and the numbers continue to grow. Why are these missionaries so successful? There are two significant factors why they succeed at getting Jews to accept Jesus. The first reason is the increasing vulnerability of Jews due to a lack of solid Jewish education and meaningful Jewish spiritual experiences. The second is the missionary's development of a cunning marketing strategy designed to overcome resistance to conversion and feeling of guilt by promoting their deceptive message. It's Jewish to believe in Jesus. Some of their tactics include mimicking Jewish holidays and rituals. For example, Missionaries may wear skull caps and prayer shawls, light Shabbos candles at their religious services, and celebrate Hanukkah, Passover, and Rosh Hashanah. They distort the meanings of these practices, claiming, for example, that the three matzot at the Passover Seder symbolize the Christian trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or Aav, Aben, in addition, they frequently use mis misleading euphemisms such as rabbi instead of in place of pastor, become a completed Jew instead of convert to Christianity, mikvah service for baptism, and synagogue instead of church. Jews for Jesus and similar groups claim to be Jews who have come to believe in Jesus. Actually, many members of groups like Jews for Jesus and even their leadership are Gentiles. They are not and have never been Jews. These missionaries claim that the most Jewish thing a Jew can do is to believe in Jesus, and the Jews can retain their Jewish identity even after becoming Christians. Being Jewish is not just a matter of lineage, but includes being a part of a community of faith. Therefore, people who are not born Jews can become Jews by embracing the spiritual path of Judaism. However, Jews who convert to another religion 
voluntarily cut themselves off from the Jewish faith community. That Jesus and his followers were Jews does not automatically confer Jewish legitimacy to their movement. The worshippers of the golden calf in the desert were also Jews, but being Jewish did not make them right. There was nothing Jewish about their idol worship. As soon as the followers of Jesus changed the Jewish concept of Messiah from a human redeemer who leads the world to a utopian age into a divine savior who dies to atone for the sins of the world, they began transforming their faith into a different religion. This critical change led to the development of a comprehensive theology that dramatically veered from its Jewish roots and was eventually formalized with the canonization of a set of scriptures vastly different from Judaism's Bible. Regardless of their superficial attempts to appear Jewish, Jews for Jesus is an oxymoron in a theological contradiction. Putting on skull caps or sprinkling their conversations with Hebrew or Yiddish expressions does not change the fact that they are following a religion that is not Jewish. A Jew who converts to Christianity is like a vegetarian who begins to eat meat. Even if he continues to eat vegetables, his diet can no longer be considered vegetarian. Since they clearly identify themselves as Jews for Jesus, they deny being deceptive. This claim itself is not true, as many of their missionaries are not Jews. In addition, they are often not totally upfront about their beliefs. While focusing on the claim that Jesus was the Messiah, their actual belief is that Jesus was God, incarnate, the second person of the Christian Trinity. Although Jews for Jesus reject the validity of rabbinic teachings, they use many practices instituted by these very same rabbis in their evangelistic presentations. Their primary deception is promoting Christianity as Jewish. And because of these tactics, many Christian groups condemn them. The Long Island Council of Churches accused Jews for Jesus of engaging in subterfuge and dishonesty, of mixing religious symbols in ways that distort the essential meaning. What are the Jewish answers to the challenges of these, these missionaries? Question one that the missionary would ask you, why don't you believe in Jesus? My answer, your answer, although Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, he died without fulfilling any of the biblical criteria that define the Messiah. The essential concept of the Messiah is of a wise and righteous king who will reign over a restored Jewish homeland and bring about a utopian world of universal peace and universal knowledge of God. In light of Jesus' failure to fulfill these and numerous other prophecies, early Christianity proposed that Jesus would return in the future and bring about a redeemed world. Aside from the fact that the, this claim could be made for any failed Messiah, this concept simply does not appear anywhere in the Jewish Bible. Furthermore, the Jewish belief in God as absolutely one and non-corporeal makes it impossible to accept the Christian belief that Jesus was God incarnate. The Torah warns us against worshipping a concept of God that our ancestors did not know, and our ancestors had no concept of a Trinitarian deity. Question two, a missionary would ask you. Did you know that the Jewish Bible contains many passages proving that Jesus was the Messiah? Your answer, my answer, this claim is baseless. Christians believe in Jesus as a matter of faith, but there is nothing in the Torah that can be used to prove this belief. Many Christian scholars acknowledge this fact. Some of the proof texts used by the missionaries are based upon mistranslations. For example, their claim that the Jewish scriptures contain a reference to the Messiah being born of a virgin has been repudiated by almost all modern Christian translations of the Bible. Most missionary proof texts are quoted out of context and are based upon a circular reasoning. Christian missionary Walter Riggins states in his 1995 book entitled Yoshua Ben David, 
Let me repeat this point, he says. There is no self-evident blueprint in the Hebrew Bible which can be said to ambiguously point to Jesus. Some proofs cited by missionaries are actually based upon texts that are totally fabricated. Another question a missionary would ask. But didn't Jesus perform miracles? And don't many Christians experience miracles today? My answer, your answer, the Jewish Bible never teaches we will be able to identify the Messiah by the miracles he will do. The reason is that even false prophets may have the ability to perform miracles. Even the Christian scriptures acknowledge that false messiahs can perform supernatural miracles. Miracles cannot prove that a particular religion is true because people of all religious faith experience miracles. This is also true of a subjective feelings of joy and spiritual fulfillment. No religion has a monopoly on these either. Furthermore, Jews do not necessarily accept all of the stories in the Christian scriptures as historically true. Interestingly, even Jews for Jesus publications maintain that many claims of the miraculous by te contemporary Christians are highly questionable. Question four, you might be asked. How will you get forgiven for your sins today without temple sacrifices? Our answer, it is an error to think that animal sacrifices were the essential way of dealing with our personal failures. None of the biblical prophets taught that animal sacrifices were indispensable in order to be forgiven for our sins. As a matter of fact, the prophets constantly berated people who mistakenly thought that sacrifices in and of themselves can attain forgiveness. The Bible clearly teaches us that the only way of atoning for sin is through repentance. In Hebrew, teshuvah, a process of transforming that includes acknowledging our wrongdoing and confessing to God, feeling regret, making restitution if we harmed someone, resolving to improve our behavior, and returning to God and praying for forgiveness. The sin offering in the Bible was only mandated for unintentional sins, and only when the temple was standing in Jerusalem. Someone who was too poor to offer an animal could bring fine, uh, fine flour to the temple. The sin offering was supposed to be an outward symbol of the person's inner change. It didn't secure forgiveness by itself. Today, in the absence of the temple, we reconnect with God in the wake of sin through sincere repentance. Question five, you might be asked, did you know that you can have a personal relationship with God through Jesus? Our answer, every person has a personal relationship with God because we are his creations and we all possess a divine soul. All we need to do is turn to God with a sincere heart and this action awakens our intrinsic spiritual closeness with Him. The Bible teaches God is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him with sincerity. The Bible never speaks of the need to approach God through an intermediary. The Bible's holiest people, such as Moses and King David, experienced deep intimacy with God directly, without believing in Jesus. Prayer, Torah study, acts of charity and kindness, and living in obedience to God's will are the means of de developing closeness with Him. Understanding and dealing with missionary tactics. Please note that not all missionary groups will employ all of the following techniques. However, these are some of the tactics that you might encounter. Famous scientist Louis Pasteur used to say, fortune favors the mind that is prepared. That is crucial to realize that missionaries operate as salespeople and not as educators. Knowing their techniques of influence and developing your own critical thinking skills is vital to resist their overtures. Number one, assuming superiority. Missionaries may attempt to elicit as many I don't know responses as possible in order to establish their superiority and credibility. 
Do not allow yourself to be intimidated. Bear in mind that they are not interested in a genuine exchange of ideas. Missionaries are driven by their agenda of attempting to sway you from your faith. Their questions are not really questions, seeking a genuine answer, but they are setups for their sales pitch. You can simply state that you would prefer to learn about biblical concept from someone who does not have a hidden agenda. Number two, deception. Some missionaries may claim to have traditional Jewish backgrounds with a solid Jewish education. All too often, this is an exaggeration or even an outright fabrication designed to establish their credibility. The implied message is that this Jew for Jesus came to accept Christianity after knowing and overcoming all the Jewish objections. Some missionaries may even present traditional Jewish objections to their position and then demonstrate how these objections lack substance. Don't expect to hear a fair or accurate presentation of the Jewish position from the missionary. Number three, love bombing. Just as salespeople often flatter and charm potential customers to prime their receptivity and clinch the sale, so too do the missionaries. Someone's warmth and friendliness has nothing to do with the validity of their ideas or sales pitch. Number four, cover-up. Missionaries may focus on issues where there is little resistance and may avoid revealing beliefs that are less palatable. For example, they may stress the idea of Jesus as the Messiah while avoiding the bottom-line Christian doctrine that claims that Jesus was actually God incarnate. Missionaries may also gloss over their conviction that good people who do not accept Jesus will be consigned to eternal damnation in hell. Number five, the numbers game. Some missionaries may inundate you with endless lists of verses from the Bible. Of course, the truth is not determined by volume. They may claim that there are over 300 biblical proofs for their positions. A careful examination of the passages in context will immediately refute their presentation. They may hide behind the numbers and say, you may be right, but if you look at all the proofs together, they are pretty impressive. It's important to remember that numerous weak pieces of ev evidence do not become stronger by combining them. 300 times th zero is still zero. Six, manipulative logic. Occasionally, missionaries may try to force you into accepting a proposition with false premises. One popular example is the assertion that Jesus was either a lunatic, a liar, or the Messiah. Missionaries assume that you won't feel comfortable with the first two options, and you will accept the third. Of course, there are other possible explanations, such as Jesus sincerely believed he was the Messiah, but he turned out to be mistaken. This scenario is consistent with Jesus' dying words, related in the Christian scripture. And he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Number seven, exploiting ambiguity. We live in a confusing, frustrating world where reality is more often gray than black and white. Sometimes missionaries may attempt to intensify your anxieties and insecurities by focusing on issues with, in, about which you feel powerless, such as terrorism, war, rampant immorality, illness, and your own mortality. Or they may play on the guilt you feel over a personal failure. Then they offer simplistic answers to these critical problems. The lure and comfort of certainty can sometimes interfere with our normal instinct to verify these claims. Number eight, short-circuiting thought. Some missionaries may denigrate your desire to carefully analyze and evaluate their claims by stating, you rely too much on your head. You have to open your heart. The Torah never tells us to base our critical decisions upon our emotions. Our Torah always warns us to think and use our minds because our hearts can often lead us astray. Another tactic the missionaries use is to pressure you for a quick 
commitment, such as, what is preventing you from accepting Jesus into your heart right now? Number nine, provoking us to jealousy. Most Jews who convert to Christianity never experience Judaism as a real spiritual path, a way of developing a personal relationship with God. Missionaries readily exploit this weakness by introducing potential converts to their enthusiastic worship services full of music and emotions. Bear in mind that a person's passions does not prove the truth of their beliefs. Every religion has adherents who have profound spiritual experiences and intense worship. The great tragedy of our time is that far too many Jews are unaware of this vital potential within their own faith. Number 10. Presupposition. A common technique employed by missionaries is to throw out the challenge. Why don't you pray to Jesus and just ask him to reveal himself to you or to give you a sign? This is a manipulative tactic to preempt thoughtful consideration and maneuver you to tacitly accept their position. And of course, missionaries will interpret virtually anything that happens to you as a divine sign, as something meant to be. Let me offer some practical recommendations. Missionaries working with organizations like Jews for Jesus are well trained, like an aggressive sales force. They push their product. They are taught to overcome all your objections and to close the sale. And it's unlikely that you will be able to reason with them. Therefore, Jews for Judaism strongly recommends that you avoid trying unless you're thoroughly schooled in the relevant biblical and theological issues. A polite but firm, no, thank you, is the most appropriate response. Resist the temptation to respond angrily or with hostility, because this reaction only bolsters their determination. Remember, although you may feel offended by their activities, they are not behaving in this way to offend you. For the most part, Jewish converts to Christianity are not villains, but the unfortunate victims of Jewish educational and spiritual malnutrition. If you do experience any missionary activity, please report it to Jews for Judaism, and their staff and trained volunteers will respond appropriately. The most effective way to counter the efforts of predatory missionaries is to make ourselves, our families, and our communities less vulnerable. Missionaries can only be successful when there is an educational and spiritual vacuum. It is vital that all Jews have a meaningful Jewish education that leads to a profound appreciation for the wisdom and beauty of Judaism. Obviously, intellectual knowledge of Judaism alone is not enough. We must bring the teachings and spirituality of Judaism into our hearts, our homes, and our daily lives. When our lives are enriched by Jewish living, when we embrace our Judaism with passion, then we will become inoculated against the missionary threat and will be less likely to stray to alien faiths. We realize that not knowing how to answer all the questions posed by missionaries seeking to convert you can be frustrating. This video is only a brief introduction to issues you may want to explore on a deeper level. Jews for Judaism has an extensive array of educational materials and offers stimulating speakers and classes throughout the year. We are available to answer your questions. As well, we provide counseling to families dealing with a loved one who has embraced another faith. And we have been successful in helping these people to return to their families and to Judaism. If you would like any information or to arrange a private consultation, please contact us at Jews for Judaism.ca. Thank you, my friends.